Thanks so much for this great introduction. It's really uh, a pleasure to be able to, to be here and share some work with you. So I wanted to start today um, talking about uh, Washington DC, which is where we would have had this uh, meeting had it not been for COVID. And I wanted to just uh, point out something that I found really striking is we all know we're, we're scientists and we don't live in a vacuum. We're affected by the events that are going on around us. And um, it's a historic time right now where there's no denying that fact. And something I thought was really uh, impressive was the, the uh, mayor of DC took uh, a stance and you know, wrote Black Lives Matter in the streets, as you can see, and many of you, many of you know about this already. And I thought this was a, a really powerful way to send a message. Um, and also, I thought it reminded me a little bit about why I think this Future Directions Forum is so unique and important. Um, many of you are early career researchers, but what you will be is future leaders. You'll be uh, heads and chairs of departments, and you'll be deans of universities. You'll be editors of journals, and you'll be sitting on uh, study sections where you get to decide what work gets funded. And even though it seems far away, you'll be in that position before you know it. So what I wanted to sort of um, kind of make a plea for everyone is to think about what you'll do when you're in those positions of leadership and how will you use your power? Um, what are the things that you'll prioritize when you get into a position where you make funding decisions, you decide who gets hired, uh, you decide um, what uh, science is important for society and uh, for scientists to pursue. So I'll just uh, leave this quote here from Toni Morrison that if you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. And I think that's always a, a nice thing to remember when um, you yourselves get into those, those high level positions that you earned. So what our lab does, we're the Brain Connectivity and Cognition Laboratory at the University of Miami. And broadly, we study brain development from childhood and adolescence into adulthood. And we uh, look at how this underpins cognitive development. So the emergence of sophisticated abilities, uh, executive functions in particular, but uh, a lot of different types of cognitive development are of interest for our laboratory. And we're also very interested in this question of what happens uh, when you have atypical development, structural and functional uh, brain connectivity that um, develops in an atypical way and how does that affect cognitive development? So uh, what we do generally is we, we have three sort of different arms of our work. Uh, one is just looking at cognitive neuroscience techniques to study typical adult populations and then looking at children or adolescents and comparing them to adults or looking across the lifespan at different ages from childhood uh, all the way up into old age. And finally, we uh, study brain networks and their um, integrity and configuration in clinical populations. A lot of times we focus here on autism spectrum disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and I'll show you some of that work today. Uh, but we focus on a range of clinical populations that are all uh, characterized by atypical development of brain networks. We can do this by using uh, functional and structural neuroimaging, which is a non-invasive way to get a window into how the brain is functioning. Um, so we do uh, functional activation and connectivity studies using functional magnetic resonance imaging. We look at the structural connect home, uh, into, uh, different, how different parts of the brain are structurally connected using diffusion weighted imaging. And we do some connectivity modeling and uh, analyses that let us uh, understand causal interactions between different brain regions as uh, both as we um, have participants complete tasks in the scanner and also just during the resting state, which I think um, is an, an exciting future direction. And we've been focusing a lot in the last uh, few years on cognitive flexibility in the brain networks that support development of flexible behaviors. And uh, this is a, just a picture of a child putting on a sock, but I, I hear a lot of times from those who work with uh, children with autism or have children in their families um, that there's sometimes these insistence on sameness behaviors, uh, wanting to wear a particular outfit or a particular color of a particular article of clothing and, and really um, liking things to be the same. Uh, and this kind of inflexibility can sometimes get in the way of day-to-day uh, -to -day life activities, for example. Um, so we've been focusing a lot on this, what we think of as a high level cognitive ability and the brain systems that underlie it. And why, we, why do we think cognitive flexibility is especially important in autism? Well, 
this uh, table shows you here some surprising and perhaps grim statistics of uh, outcomes of, of children who grow up and become young adults with autism spectrum disorder. And as you'll, you'll see here, about 80% um, of individuals uh, on the spectrum don't uh, end up living outside of their, you know, their home communities, or and many of them end up staying with their parents uh, well into adulthood and, and late life. Uh, and this is a surprisingly high number compared to other forms of developmental disability, as you can see. And you also see, uh, unfortunately, high rates of unemployment and underemployment in young adults with autism. Uh, close to 80%, um, you know, don't reach this uh, full employment, um, as you can see, between the ages of 21 and 25. And a lot of the, uh, the clinical aspects of, of intervention in autism do tend to focus on um, social communication and, and social skills training, which is very necessary, of course. But there's uh, another aspect of this, the disorder, as I mentioned, the restricted and repetitive behaviors. Uh, that, and, and one of those behaviors is um, related to insistence on sameness and rigidity and uh, adherence to routines. Basically, inflexibility is, is what we see a lot of the time. And there are certain uh, uh, interventions that have been rather successful in training and enhancing flexible behaviors. Here I'm giving one example, unstuck and on target, um, that uh, you know, uses uh, uh, ABA and other types of approaches to enhance flexibility in children with autism. Uh, and of course, it's important to start all of these uh, as early as possible to, um, you know, to reach the optimal outcomes. So I think that uh, focusing on flexible behaviors in autism is sort of a, a little bit understudied and a little bit underappreciated, but really an important direction to go. And uh, there's been a lot of development in cognitive neuroscience of uh, how to study flexible behavior in the lab. So you might have the kinds of tasks where you, for example, you know, uh, you're meant to say what color this fish is in some uh, blocks of the trial and uh, other trials you're saying which direction the fish is pointing and then these uh, you know engage flexibility and that the child has to kind of switch between different rules or task switching or uh, set shifting kinds of tasks or, or what have often been used to study flexibility in the lab or you know pick two objects that go together in one way and you might pick two blue objects or two objects that are both rabbits or uh, you know all kinds of um, ways of grouping that uh, that test abstract thinking. So these are the, the kinds of ways that flexibility is often looked at in the laboratory. But at the same time, you have daily life flexible behaviors and how is a child, you know, uh, focusing in the classroom or, or you know, engaging with, with other peers. And these are things you can really only get from asking the parent or asking the teacher at informant report kinds of measures, um, you know. How does the child over, uh, react to small problems or uh, you know, clean up their bedroom and things like that? So these are sort of the real world aspect of flexible behaviors that can be studied with scales like this one, the behavior rating inventory of executive function. And right now, of course, we're um, experiencing this uh, enhanced period of stay at home and not being so flexible in our daily activities. There's been a few articles on this um, in Spectrum which uh, talk about how uh, autism in particular, um, how individuals with autism are experiencing the pandemic. And uh, there's a great article here about stories from around the world. Um, and it's uh, a quote from, from one of that, uh, one of these interviews um, talks about, uh, no matter where you live, routines are an important part of life and the pain of change is real. Uh, in many ways, autistic adults have felt this pain more intensely than their neurotypical peers. But um, you know, along with this change in routine, can also there can also be growth. So um, you know, a lot of times, all of us are experiencing this right now. We're learning to live with the uncertainty. We're learning to live with changes in our routines, um, and this is, in some ways, helps us to relate better to those who are on the spectrum. Um, and in the sense, neurotypicals are for the first time experiencing this over overwhelming fear of uncertainty um, that this autistic woman says she experiences every day. So, um, you know, now we, when we go outside, this requires a checklist, a plan of action, a script, and a ritual, something that she says she's done since she was old enough to walk. So in some ways, this uh, pandemic that we're living through may help us to sympathize um, the kinds of daily experiences that individuals with autism have, uh, have experienced their whole lives. 
Right now we're doing a uh, psychosocial impact survey to look at the children that we've um, brought into our studies previously. So usually we bring in kids and have them do some of the tasks I've showed you. Uh, we collect brain imaging data from them as they conduct these um, experiments. And we're trying to now follow up with those same children to see how they've been coping over the last three months uh, in terms of their uh, social emotional um, you know, uh, outcomes and reactions to this stay at home order. And uh, so that's something we're doing in terms of an online survey to follow up with parents who've previously participated. The other aspect of our work is really looking at the cognitive neuroscience, the neuroimaging of uh, the, you know, the brain systems that we think support flexible behaviors. And we have reason to think that brain dynamics are very important for enabling flexible cognition. Here you can see an individual who's just doing nothing at all, just this is resting state fMRI. So just even lying in the scanner over a period of 10 minutes, you'll see that the brain spontaneously fluctuates between these coherent large scale systems with a very low frequency, 0.01 to uh, 0.1 hertz. But the red areas that come together, as you can see over time, these uh, sometimes are forming what you, what you would call language networks or attention networks or memory networks visual networks, all of the brain regions and systems that we engage during our day-to-day -day, uh, cognitive activities and day-to-day -day lives, they're sort of spontaneously represented in these coherent low-frequency fluctuations. And for many years, uh, we've been taking advantage of this property to understand the integrity of large-scale brain networks. Now, one way to sort of compute uh, or quantify the dynamics you can see um, is to, instead of looking over a fixed period of time, let's say 10 minutes, and averaging the connectivity of certain brain regions uh, compared with others, you can look at what's called a sliding window. So you could take maybe a 45 second window and then move over uh, to another 45 second window and look at the whole brain pattern of functional connectivity that's characteristic of each of those windows. And the uh, matrices you see here are what would happen if you uh, sort of cut up the brain into several hundred pieces or parcels and said, what's the correlation between each one piece with another piece of the brain, with red being higher and, and blue being lower? And this is just to show that if you broke up a 10-minute uh, resting state scan into shorter chunks, you'd see changes over time. There's, these are dynamics. The brain isn't just doing one thing. It's not just stationary, right? And uh, some of these newer methods that we talk about in the Future Directions paper um, let us quantify these dynamics. We can do k-means clustering to see how many uh, different states or profiles of brain connectivity are apparent. You might uh, find that there's three or four or five different states. Um, and then you can do further, um, compute further metrics from these, like uh, frequency of occurrence. How often does state two occur? You can look at dwell time. Once your brain gets into this state two, how long does it stay in that state? You can also look at state transitions. So going from one state to, the, to another, how, how often does this occur? How many transitions are there? Lots of ways to characterize brain dynamics. And um, so this is an exciting ongoing and current and future direction by now. Um, and the next uh, thing, which I don't think I even talked about, or maybe I did talk about in the 2018 paper, but it's uh, another way of doing the same kind of dynamic analysis, but it's called co-activation pattern analysis. And here you would actually just take every time point along a time series of however long, how much data you have collected and assign each time point to a particular cluster based again on the whole brain pattern of activation at each voxel and use again things like clustering, different kinds of clustering are available, but you could use k-means for example to identify two, three, four, five, however many states are determined to be optimal um, and then find again uh, things like dwell time, how long a state persists, uh, transitions between states and frequency of occurrence of a, any given state. So um, lots of you know, exciting new methods for quantifying brain dynamics. I'm just giving you two examples here, but uh, the field is so rapidly growing that in the, the last couple of years, there's, there's just been an explosion of different methods. Um, some newer ones in, involve uh, hidden Markov modeling and other approaches to directly estimate the number of transitions from the data and a lot going on in this field. So, so watch this area. So in, in autism, we started with a very simple hypothesis that if 
typical individuals, uh, you know, their brains traverse through multiple states over a given period of time. Perhaps there's just fewer transitions between brain states in autism, and perhaps that's why we see these difficulties with flexible behavior and difficulties transitioning between activities, for example, insistence on sameness. So this was the first thing we, um, we tested out as we uh, pursued these hypotheses. And a lot of this work I'll be showing you today has been done by Jason Nomi, who's been working uh, with our lab for six years. And uh, he uses here independent component analysis applied to a data set of uh, adults with autism um, from the Autism Brain Imaging Data Exchange, which I'll get into in a little bit. And what he's first done is just, like I said, parceled up the brain or cut up the brain into uh, different pieces using uh, a data-driven um, approach. And then, you know, looked at all the connections between these different brain areas pairwise and found that here there's at least four states, and I've arranged them from most frequently occurring uh, to least frequently occurring, and you can see some interesting patterns there. Um, and uh, just looking at the number of transitions between uh, the individuals with autism spectrum disorder and the typically developing individuals, we did find this initial evidence that, uh, as we suspected, the brains of the adults with autism are not going through quite as many transitions as the, uh, the neurotypical individuals that were, that were in this data set. So these are the ways that, um, you know, just examples of how dynamics can, uh, you know, get us a little bit of insight into what is going on in the brains of, of these individuals. And here, Emily Marshall, who did a um, honors thesis in our lab, an undergrad honors thesis, used the co-activation pattern uh, method that I mentioned on a different data set from Abide and also data that we collected in the lab and looked at these um, patterns that are associated with what we have called the salience network or the mid-singular insular network. These, this network has nodes in the anterior insula that you see here, as well as the anterior singular cortex. And often when you use independent component analysis, you can see this network come out very cleanly um, from a data set. And what she did was look at the co-activation patterns of that network with, uh, with multiple other networks in the brain and here found evidence for five states with the salients sort of co-active with the regions shown in each of these states. And uh, uh, it's just another, like I said, a different approach for looking at dynamics, but again, lets you quantify um, various metrics. And here, the, the frequency of occurrence of one of these particular states was reduced in autism, even though the other ones were all present, there was a state in which uh, the salience network is uh, typically coupled with uh, what we call the central executive, lateral frontal parietal network, as well as the default mode or medial frontal parietal uh, regions. So we found one evidence for one of these states uh, being less frequent in, the, uh, in this study, kids with autism that were examined. Um, so another approach, again, for looking at brain network dynamics in autism. This work um, is also being uh, take, undertaken right now by um, Lauren Kupis, a grad student in the lab, and Bryce Dirks and Willa Voorhees, who worked in the lab previously, uh, we had collected data from children as they did this very, quite simple task, um, just uh, asking the child sort of which one is different from the others. And in some blocks the, uh, of the task, the, uh, the color is the defining feature of the difference, whereas in other, um, the shape is the defining difference, a square versus a circle, and in, in uh, some blocks they're switching between shape and mix, uh, shape and color, which means that they have to sort of flexibly adjust their response, um, you know, on the fly. And we had children doing this task, we had them in the resting state, and we actually were, uh, what Lauren was able to do here is quantify the co-activation between uh, the mid-singular insular network that I've already mentioned, the lateral frontal parietal network and the default mode or medial frontal parietal network. And over the course of, of time, you can see that not all of these regions are doing the same thing in any given period. So sometimes two of the networks are highly coactive. Sometimes there's only one that's, that's uh, sort of on and other times there's, there's different networks that sort of pop up. And we were able to make uh, um, some, on the left here, some quantifications of exactly how these cap or coactivation patterns emerge while the participants do this task and also while they're in the resting state, um, which gave us some insight into the fact that towards the end of the, the trials, towards the end of the task, uh, 
the kids with autism, even though they're able to do pretty well behaviorally, they, they do well in terms of reaction time and accuracy, they still have to engage um, or co-engage these networks to a greater degree than the kids who are typically developing. So it's like their brains are, are doing extra work here even to, um, to perform at the same level. So these are the kinds of studies we do to um, show how or to explore how dynamic functional connectivity can reveal atypical patterns of brain dynamics in prevalent neurodevelopmental disorders characterized by cognitive inflexibility, such as autism spectrum disorder. And the extent to which these brain dynamics underlie individual differences in flexible behaviors is uh, currently under investigation. So finally, we get to the, the paper that uh, Andy mentioned. And this was the, um, the future directions we wrote in 2018. And this was, um, I decided to, to write this with, uh, with Katie Carlsgott, who's an expert in neurodevelopment and schizophrenia. And, uh, and I just wanted to show some pictures of us from grad school. So this is circa 2005. And, uh, and you know, we were roommates back then. And of course, we're, we're friends still to this day. And I just think sometimes it's uh, important to remember that your friends and your roommates and your colleagues now that, you know, at your early stages in your life will be your colleagues and co collaborators and friends, hopefully for many years to come. So, um, so, you know, keep in touch with those grad school friends because you'll often uh, end up finding that they're experts in a field that, um, that you want to collaborate on and it, it makes for, for good times and good writing. So, um, I won't go over everything in this paper today, uh, but I'll just highlight some of the things that I think that I thought were important in 2018, I think are even more important now. Um, and one of the things we emphasized was data and resource sharing. So in, in neuroimaging, uh, there's been uh, just a explosion of sharing of data sets uh, over the last 10 years or so. Um, and some of them are listed in this table here, and you may have heard of them. The Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Study, or ABCD, is, is one large one that's ongoing. The uh, PING, or Pediatric Imaging Neurocognition and Genetics Study. Um, there's the Lifespan Human Connectome Project and, and other Human Connectome Projects data sets. There's NKI, or Nathan Klein Institute, uh, Child Mind Institute data, longitude or lifespan data sets that are available. Um, ADHD 200, another open data set studying ADHD, and ABIDE, the Autism Brain Imaging Data Exchange. And so what these um, efforts are doing are collecting large data sets and, and organizing them with uh, including phenotypic information and all kinds of variables and brain imaging data. And what this has done is made it possible for researchers who aren't collecting these data sets themselves to nevertheless use them with, with essentially no barriers and no restrictions um, for most of these data sets. And there's the, the partial list I'm showing you here, and I think there's actually more than what's in this table. Uh, you can see there's a wide age range available in some of these um, and, and different kinds of information along with genetics in some of the data sets. So there's just, a, it's an amazing time to be starting your own lab or be to wanting to branch out into an area where you might not have uh, been able to work before due to lack of data. Um, this sort of data and resource sharing, of course, code is also now available for all these types of data analyses that I've shown you. And it's been a wonderfully collaborative few years and I, I think that's just what makes for good science. This is just an example of some of the things our lab has done to take advantage of these data sets to answer questions about brain development and more broadly uh, about uh, organization of large scale brain networks across the lifespan. So this is one of our brain connectivity and cognition lab projects where we use the NKI or the Nathan Klein Institute data set. Shruti Vij, who was a postdoc at the time, um, looked at data from individuals age six through 85, quite large data set, resting state fMRI data, and looked at network um, connectivity and interactions between brain networks as they change as a function of age. And uh, another study from that same data set was done by Jason Nomi in the lab where we looked at brain signal variability and how that changes again from age six to 85 and uh, found some interesting effects in, in brain areas like the anterior insula. Um, all of this, of course, done with the public data sets. We didn't have to collect any data on our own to be able to do these projects. So it's a great way to, um, to make new discoveries uh, using data that's already out there. 
Uh, this is one of the projects that Paolo Driazola in our lab, uh, who's now a grad student at Yale, um, she did a few years back looking at amygdala, frontal amygdala connectivity. We know, of course, those circuits are very important for emotion regulation, and uh, there's been a lot of interest in characterizing them in autism for that reason. And she just found, you know, you know some very interesting uh, developmental effects using a data set where we had children from ages uh, seven to um, sort of young adulthood, seven to 24 or so. Um, and uh, all these references are here in case you're interested in looking further into it. Um, and this was, again, using the ABIDE or Autism Brain Imaging Data Exchange. Uh, um, we had, again, from Jason, one of these studies where we looked specifically at network connectivity in children with autism and adolescents with autism and adults with autism because um, we thought we had some developmental hypotheses and, and we did indeed find uh, effects in children that were not seen in adult, adolescents and adults. So all of this was, was made available, uh, was made possible through the ABIDE initiative that uh, Adriana DiMartino um, instigated some years ago. And here's an example of the Human Connectome Project. Now hundreds and hundreds of adult subjects are available with really high resolution resting state fMRI and very good structural diffusion weighted imaging data as well. This is just showing you how we can characterize connectivity of the insular regions with frontal lobe regions um, using this data set. And HCP also has tasks, many seven different tasks from hundreds of subjects. And Taylor Bolt, when he was a grad student in our lab, worked on some neuroinformatics projects that were taking these seven different types of, uh, of task data sets and showing similarities between them and trying to find a general factor structure that uh, explains most of the variance in these data sets. So you can go anywhere from neurodevelopmental disorders to neuroinformatics using some of the um, tools and data sets that are out there right now. Uh, and all of this is, you know, it was all very fortuitous for me because I started my lab in uh, 2014 and the HCP data set came out just about that year, I believe. The uh, Abide data set was released, the first one, in 2014. So uh, it was, you know, the best time ever to, to start a lab and hit the ground running in terms of uh, analyzing your imaging data to, to answer questions about brain development. So that's the plug for you know using public data sets and also contributing to public data sets with um, you know whatever resources you have available. The other thing we've spent some time thinking about and I think is an important future direction is um, incorporating machine learning for classification, prediction, and parsing heterogeneity of neurodevelopmental disorders. And for most of you, you've already heard by now this uh, R doc idea or research domain criteria. So the National Institute of Health has um, pushed over the last few years for us to go beyond uh, DSM categories, which are usually symptom-based uh, kind of diagnostic um, approaches, to looking at integrating across uh, brain behavior and uh, life experience, physiology, different markers, in order to better understand the heterogeneity and comorbidity um, in, in development and in other disorders that are onset later in life. So the example here from the Insel and Cutler paper is that if you have the category major depressive disorder, it might include a, a quite a heterogeneous group of individuals. Um, but if you try to then group them um, using genetic, a combination of genetic factors, perhaps brain activity, you know, physiology and other markers, behavioral markers, you may end up being able to stratify or cluster the groups of individuals into um, into these subgroups that are more similar and perhaps they no longer fit the original grouping of major dis uh, depressive disorder anymore, but they might be more likely to be treated by a particular pharmacological agent or some other, um, some other sort of treatment approach that's more tailored to their specific, uh, you know, um, their, their specific needs. So this kind of uh, stratification by these different markers has been a big push so far in the last few years. So one of the things we've done, uh, there's been a little bit of work trying to look at heterogeneity and comorbidity in autism spectrum disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder using brain imaging and markers of, of different kinds of cognitive markers as, as I showed you in the last slide. This is some work from uh, Lombardo on the left here, um, just nicely visualizing how you could group a population of individuals with autism into their subtypes and 
perhaps find that on a given dependent variable, you may not have seen a group difference if you just do this case control approach. But if you get these subtypes correctly uh, subtyped, you might be able to see that one autism subtype is, uh, is you know, coming clearly out as a, a different subtype than others and might be uh, requiring this uh, more targeted treatment in a specific domain. So this is a, a nice visualization of the RDoC concept here. And uh, here, Fair's group has also looked at using brain imaging to detect communities with or subtypes within ADHD. And these are communities based on brain connectivity metrics, such as the one that, um, such as ones that can be derived from resting state fMRI, for example. So in our own lab, we uh, have collaborated a bit with Stuart Mostofsky's group at um, uh, Johns Hopkins to uh, look at what he's got a nice sample of is, is children with autism, children with ADHD, and children with comorbid autism and ADHD, and then typically developing children with lots of measures, as you can see here on the left. And um, importantly for us, the behavioral rating inventory of executive function or the brief, which gives us a nice uh, parent report of, of executive function in the real, real world. So Dina Dajani, when she was a grad student in the lab, first asked this question of, are there subgroups of children with, uh, in this you know, mixed group, ASD, ADHD combined, uh, are there subgroups of executive function abilities or do some kids have some deficits and other kids have other deficits? And it turns out she found, um, using the brief, she found evidence for uh, an average, above average and impaired um, executive function classes amongst this mixed group of, of children. And what's interesting is it wasn't that any kid with a disorder showed impaired executive function. In fact, the, uh, the, the average EF group here in the middle um, showed a, a, a group of kids, typically developing kids, but then 35% of kids in the average group there were the ADHD, 18% um, were the kids with ASD. So you see a great deal of heterogeneity and not every child showed the same levels of impairment. And in fact, in the impaired EF group, executive function group, what's most interesting is, or most telling, is that the comorbid ASD and ADHD children are the ones who tend to fall in the impaired group. So this tells us something about comorbidities impacts on these um, uh, daily life executive functions. Uh, and then Adriana Baez in our lab, another honors uh, student, did a replication of that using some of our own data um, just looking at autism versus typical. But again, you know, 31% of kids in this average executive function group are those uh, kids who are diagnosed with autism but are still doing well. Um, so there's a great deal of heterogeneity when we look at these uh, measures. And that means that you know, not everyone is gonna get the same treatment or will benefit from the same treatment. Um, and an understanding sort of what these profiles are of, of strengths and deficits is uh, I think, important first step towards um, you know, sort of getting a, a better handle on, uh, on how we can best treat individual children. So we also found, you know, as we're doing these sort of parsing heterogeneity studies that uh, those in the impaired executive function group tend to have difficulties that go spill over into other domains like higher socio-emotional problems, attention and aggression was seen in the impaired executive function class. Of course, that's, um, again, regardless of whether that group of children was in the autism or ADHD or TD group. And uh, this is just the, the replication of looking at how um, the kids in the impaired group or, or below average or above average groups showed uh, different differential attention problems and social uh, problems, or whether or not they were in the clinical category. So one thing that, again, Dina in the lab was concerned with is whether or not these executive function profiles that you can see from parent report map onto neurobiologically distinct groups, or you know, how can we sort of look at the biological basis of these heterogeneous categories. So she actually grouped the same data set she was looking at before in the latent profile analysis. and. Um, started with one set of groupings that was a typical group, an ADHD group, and an ASD group. And that's how most studies are conducted. And then we looked at a, a, a sample that was then split by the comorbidities. So there was an ASD plus ADHD group that was pulled out and examined. 
And the final grouping was based on the latent profile analysis um, of the brief measure. So then we looked at above average, average EF and impaired uh, executive function groups. And in that analysis, it was independent of which clinical group the kids originally fell in. It was just grouped by executive function profile. And then we did um, a group independent component analysis and used an approach called dual regression to look for group differences in some of the large scale brain networks I've been uh, talking about up to this point. So here, if you look at ICA, you can, um, you can almost identify a lot of uh, common networks. We focused here on uh, the default load network, lateral frontal parietal, because we think it's involved in executive function more specifically, and the uh, salience or insular uh, networks that are circled here. Now, what was surprising in this study is that none of the groupings I showed you, um, there were no significant differences, whether you looked at the clinical diagnostic categories or the executive function profiles. And this was in contrast to a lot of um, other studies who, using the same approach, even our own previous studies that have shown group differences along these uh, network connectivity me measures. So, you know, even though we're starting to pay attention to heterogeneity, um, there's not always a clear cut brain difference between these groups that fall into different executive function categories. Another thing we've done is use one of the tasks, uh, this one I showed you earlier, the flexible item selection task. And in the scanner, if you, um, you know, you ask people to pick two cards that go together in one way, and then they'll pick, you know, something matching on color, and then pick two other cards that go together in another way, and they might match on a different attribute, and then, you know, pick another set of cards that go together, and they might pick uh, for another different reason. This um, we had done in 30 or so adults just to see if the brain regions that we expect to be um, activated would activate during the task, and luckily they did. And then we took those regions of interest. Um, so on the bottom is the, the study that was done in adults. We took the peak coordinates that are activated in this type of flexibility task and we made regions of interest around them, which you can see at the top there. Um, and they're coded by sort of the common network names that you often see in the field. And then we asked the question, is there something about the connectivity amongst these networks that would let us um, subgroup or uh, subtype the individuals with autism and ADHD? So this is, again, that same mixed sample of kids with autism, kids who are uh, ADHD diagnosed, and kids who have comorbid autism and ADHD, as well as typically developing kids. So we thought, in this mixed group, can the brain connectivity profiles be used to parse the heterogeneity or to look for subgroups? And we found some evidence for three subgroups, but it, the uh, individual level pass this is uh, using an approach called group iterative multiple uh, model estimation by um, Katie Gates at UNC. And these individual level paths were, there's just great levels of heterogeneity, very few group level connections that were consistent. So these subgroups weren't really stable or valid, and we couldn't really interpret them to mean that there were meaningful subgroups in the data. And in fact, we only found an, a, you know, in the group level path that was consistent across all subjects, we found a relationship where the stronger connectivity of that uh, connection was related to better executive function in, across all subjects, regardless of, of their diagnosis. So <clears throat> just because we're trying to parse heterogeneity using brain connectivity or using executive function pro pro profiles doesn't mean that we've been successful at this point. So what I'd like to you know, emphasize here is that both autism and ADHD should be considered in the context of considerable phenotypic heterogeneity. Uh, which is inconvenient but has to be uh, considered. And the RDOC or research domain criteria approaches that consider spectrums of behaviors and brain metrics across clinical and non-clinical groups. It's now being pushed a lot, it's now being encouraged by funding agencies, but these the studies I've just shown you highlight the difficulties associated with parsing heterogeneity and or developmental disorders. Um, there's a lot we could talk about this and I'll, I'll leave it for a discussion later, but um, just because NIH wants you to do it doesn't mean it's going to be straightforward and it's going to work. Um, but I think that this points to the need for novel data-driven approaches that, that need to be developed in order to help these, uh, to inform the revised diagnostic nosologies that are being uh, suggested. And um, so I think there's a lot of work to do here. This is a, definitely a future direction. And uh, finally, we actually are doing something now which um, comes as a, 
a surprise to even myself. So we, we had been for years collecting data using um, tasks of cognitive flexibility to examine brain networks in, involved in executive function in kids with autism. But one thing we, um, we found is that we're in South Florida where uh, the majority of households speak Spanish at home. And so a lot of our kids with autism are bilingual. They, um, they speak Spanish and English in the home. And uh, as you can see from this map, of course, Spanish is the most commonly spoken language other than English in the US. So it's not just uh, in Florida where this is a, a common occurrence. And so um, one thing we've been very interested in is this idea that has been around in psychology for a long time, which is that there might be an advantage of being bilingual in the executive function domain. Um, that is that individuals who are bilingual because they're often switching between languages are required to use the processes of inhibitory control um, in their daily life. And this might transfer over to greater uh, executive function abilities outside of the domain of language. So this has been the bilingual advantage hypothesis for which there's been both um, some evidence and some counter evidence over the last few years. But what hasn't been really looked at is how this influences um, uh, development and brain development in autism. And in fact, for many communication disorders, the common recommendation by clinicians is to just teach one language in the home, because if you're already having trouble and language delays, then the thought was that uh, trying to teach two languages would be even more difficult for the child. However, there isn't really a lot of work in autism per se, and so the recommendation isn't at this point based on uh, a whole lot of evidence. Um, and in fact, there's been a lot of work showing that there doesn't appear to be any harm in terms of language development in children with autism in particular. Um, this has come out in the recent few years, even suggesting that bilingualism might um, you know, help set shifting deficits or help cognitive flexibility deficits and, uh, and not really harm language development either. So there's been a lot more work, as you can see, these are fairly recent papers that have um, asked this question of, is there a bilingual advantage in executive function in children with autism? Um, more and more evidence showing that there doesn't seem to be any harm and there might in fact be some benefit to, to being bilingual you know, outside of the fact that it helps to speak more than one language. So this is for us some, I mean, this is a future direction that I never thought we'd be working in because I don't know the first thing about language, but this is uh, um, what Celia Romero in our lab has um, been pursuing uh, ever since she looked at our own data set and looked at our brief measures from our kids with autism and realized when she was on the phone with parents that you know a good chunk of our kids that we already have brought into the to the studies were bilingual and if you look in our own preliminary data here I'm showing that um, consistent with some large studies that have recently been published that typically developing kids don't appear to show any bilingual advantage in the executive function domain so there's a straight line for the orange TDs, bilingual and monolingual, typically developing kids don't seem to get any boost from being bilingual. But in the kids with autism, who of course, by and large, are more impaired in the uh, executive function domain, those who are um, bilingual are looking closer to the kids who are um, typically developing in terms of their executive function. So it's like they do get a little bit of a boost from um, being bilingual, and this is Spanish English bilingual in this in this case. So we are actively pursuing this question now, and just I think it's going to be a fascinating area. Um, so, so you know, hopefully in a couple of years I'll be able to tell you how this is panning out. So in general, uh, what I've showed you today is the kind of work we're doing that looks at the brain basis of flexible behaviors across typical and atypical development, and uh, for the focus on autism spectrum disorder, where we <clears throat> where we see some uh, deficits in flexibility. And the goal is to sort of work towards understanding what the brain mechanisms are that, um, that underlie these behaviors and, and with the eventual goal of tailoring treatments using personalized medicine approaches, um, leveraging machine learning and big data sets, as I mentioned throughout. Um, and ultimately, you know, getting children to focus less on uh, what's on their feet and more on their social interactions and their uh, interactions with the rest of the world. And this is actually my collaboration network. And I put this here to, um, again, emphasize how important I think collaboration is and always will be for, um, for our science, for all of us uh, trying to, to do things that are 
um, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary. You never get enough expertise in just one lab, and I don't think there's any reason to ever limit yourself to just the the people in your building or just the people in your lab when there's so much knowledge out there and so much that can be done collaboratively. This is actually an example of that um, group of researchers from all over the world who are talking about how the uh, you know, the urgent need for integrated science to fight COVID and, and beyond. And it's it's true that we'll need to do more and more of this kind of collaboration to tackle the, the real world problems that, that we're facing. So I think that, uh, you know, that's kind of the, the place where I am in terms of my own thinking. Um, over the years, I've gotten more collaborative. If I think I always was, but I think uh, it's clear that you can see these benefits from um, from expanding your circles in terms of who you're who you work with. This is the uh, the lab back in the days when we would go to the lab, and uh, many of the people who I've uh, or pictured here have done all the the lovely work that I've talked about today, and. Uh, this is some of the funding and the individuals. Um, I'm sure I've missed so many names here, so forgive uh, me for whoever is not listed here, but when you um, collaborate a lot, you tend to not be able to update your acknowledgement slides quite fast enough. Um, here's some further reading in, in case anyone's um, interested in following up on some of the, uh, the things that I mentioned today. Um, with regards to the insular cortex and salient number that I didn't have time to get into, um, the idea of precision medicine and uh, machine learning, um, a review here with Manish Sagar, and uh, a paper that I just have out now in biological psychiatry that talks more about flexible cognition behavior and autism. And I'd like to thank you. Thanks, Andy, for the invitation. Thanks, all of you, for being here. I'm happy to take some questions in the last few minutes.